In July 1947, something extraordinary crashed into the New Mexico desert. The Air Force contends that it was simply a weather balloon. However, scores of witnesses to the event insist there was spacecraft piloted by alien beings from beyond. For the past several years, one of the most exhaustive investigations of a UFO event has been conducted, making the Roswell case the best documented in UFO history. One of the principal investigators of the case is Kevin Randall. Kevin has interviewed over 100 witnesses to the crash and recovery, allowing him to reconstruct the series of events. When we began our research, we tried to look at alternative explanations. Was it a V-2 rocket? Uh, we were able to gather all the documentation for that. There are no launches missing that would account for the Brazel de uh, debris nor the impact site. Experimental aircraft, aircraft accidents, uh, balloon tests. We looked at all of this. There was nothing there. Uh, the Air Force, um, in, in an apparent preemptive strike to, to shut down the GAO investigation, announced that it was Project Mogul, this top secret balloon. They imply in their report that there was something special about the balloons. They say that it's balloon launch number four made on the 4th of June, 1947. It laid in the field for um, a month before it was retrieved. The problem with that is we have the documentation for balloon launch number four. It says it was an array of uh, normal meteorological balloons, nothing special about them, with a sonoboy, which is in essence a microphone. No indications that the uh, balloons came down on the Brazel Ranch. The Air Force report mentions the July 9th article from the Roswell Daily Record where Mac Brazel was interviewed and was explaining what it looked like. And it sounds like a balloon. If uh, if, we, if he can be believed, and we say that simply because he's clearly been coached. But he says in the text of that article that he had found weather balloons on two separate occasions and that this was nothing like those. The Air Force leaves out one of the critical lines of his report about he was sure it wasn't a weather observation device. He'd found them before, there was nothing like those. And yet, balloon launch number four, the Air Force culprit, was in fact meteorological balloons. It would have been just exactly like what he'd found before, but the Air Force leaves one of the statements out of there. Public interest in the last few years has increased very greatly in a phenomenon which has been identified as flying saucers. These stories have led to much fiction and much fancy. I would like to separate a few facts from some of the fiction that has been traveling around across the country. These myths will continue uh, for months or even years to come. For the last four years, the Navy has had a project in the study of cosmic rays, which has lent some fact to these stories. <laughs> Inflating an immense balloon aboard the USS Norton Sound, the Navy prepares for further study of the elusive cosmic rays somewhere in the Pacific. That's the news. A secondary consideration clears up the mystery of the so-called flying saucers. For it is these monsters which rise 19 miles and attain diameters of 100 feet that have been mistaken for the apparitions called flying saucers. At great altitudes, they tell us, these elongated enormities flatten out like plates. Mystery ended.
So they talked to Irving Newton, who never saw the real debris. They talked to now Lieutenant Colonel Sheridan Cavett. Cavett told Don and me repeatedly, as late as this last June, he wasn't in Roswell when this happened. He had been assigned to the base, but he was not there, he was on leave. He tells the Air Force, yes, I was there, I went out with Marcel. What does that tell you about what, the, the veracity of Cavett? There are other problems with his story. He says that the moment he saw the debris, he knew it was a balloon. Why didn't he communicate this very critical piece of intelligence to Jesse Marcel, so that Jesse Marcel wouldn't run back to the base and tell his boss, Colonel Blanchard, we've got a flying saucer, and Blanchard announces it to the world. There's only one way, I think, and we've talked about this endlessly here at the center, is that how Roswell could be kept secret. And I think the answer is that they made a conscious decision immediately to keep it extremely secret. Okay. Why is the Air Force, you know, putting out ridiculous information just to manipulate the information why do they have to do that? Why does that problem occur? I think the, that, that's a very complex question. Yeah. Um, starting in 1947, it, it seems to make some sense. Here we're presented with a technology that if we can figure this technology out, then we've leaped way ahead of our opposition, whomever that op opposition may be. Um, we do not want the Soviets in 1947 to realize we have one of these things. So we bring down the curtain of ridicule. Oh, you believe in those little green men. If you can convince your opposition, whomever it is, that something doesn't exist, they're not going to look for it. Uh, it's the, one of the best covers you can have. Working from the direct testimonies of members of the recovery team, Bill McDonald has been able to reconstruct forensically the design of the spacecraft, revealing a technology of unearthly origin. I was allowed to meet with the United States Counterintelligence Corps Colonel who had been directly involved making sketches at the crash site at the time of recovery in the morning of July 5th, 1947. What's his name? His name is Frank Kaufman. He was probably the number three man in charge in regards to the counterintelligence corps, United States Army chain of command that was at the crash site. We also had the 509th Atomic bomb base chain of command at the crash site. Colonel Blanchard, Major Marcel, and a number of others, including the provost marshal of the base, who was a key witness to the crash site because it was his job to coordinate it off. After spending several hours with Colonel Kaufman and getting a baseline explanation of what the vehicle looked like, he showed me wet copies because in those days you didn't have Xerox machines, of the original drawings that he had sent to the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. in 1947. His drawings were very much like a modern-day spy aircraft. It looked like a miniature version of the SR-71. There was a very careful introduction made to a witness who was an air intelligence officer at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in 1952. This air intelligence officer had a background in cryptography and in admin, and his job was to generate and disperse documents in regards to the final stages of the reverse engineering studies that had been attempted on the vehicle in the underground nuclear bomb storage pit that is, in reality, the source of the original Hangar 18 legend. That nuclear bomb storage pit was completely enclosed, and it is where this small, very small vehicle was stored. This witness was able, for a three-month period in his life, to crawl through the interior of the wreckage, to walk around the wreckage, to examine it in detail. What was found in the desert in 1947 looked like modern-day wave rider designs that are on the drawing boards at Boeing and at Rockwell. This was in a time when nobody had ever even theorized a shockwave rider or a shockwave surfer at high speeds, high altitudes. This thing looked like a stingray, and it had perfect blend between its crew cabin and its little fat fuselage and its, um, shall we say, rounded delta wing configuration. It was 
all one piece. There were no seams in the skin. There were no fasteners. There were no rivets. There were no lines of delineation between subcomponents. It was all one piece from the bow to the stern and from wingtip to wingtip. In the areas where the gash was, it was peeling in layers, like layers of an onion or layers of human flesh. And it had a diapole waveguide structure that traveled up to the roof, which was at the gravitational center of the vehicle, and for which on the outside of the vehicle was kind of a dome or a, a elongated, oblong-shaped, gentle blister. We found that there were two rearward-facing seats. There was a console that wrapped around them that morphed out of the floor. And that there was one last seat facing forward the way the two front seats were facing forward, but that it was recessed at a greater angle into the very rear portion of the crew cabin from which this particular crew member's head plugged directly into the vehicle. There was a direct interface between the top of his head and that structure. When considering the Roswell case, one basic question must be asked. If nothing out of the ordinary happened at Roswell, why the extraordinary efforts to conceal it? Why do people still fear for their lives? still afraid to talk after 50 years of silence.
Thank you. 